Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to get started, and I'm just going to handle some of the intro here. My name is Elissa Hansen. I'm the president and CEO of Norspan, and the Minnesota Opportunity Collaborative is a program that is powered by Norspan, which you're going to learn a little bit more about here briefly. Today at our workshop, uh, Carl, if you want to move forward, we're going to uh, go through, we have about 90 minutes for our agenda. First, I'm gonna do a little welcome and introduction to the team that you'll be hearing from today. We'll cover, we'll cover briefly about Opportunity Zones and who uh, Minapco is. We have speakers joining us to give a little bit of a guide on the Opportunity Zones and the final regulations that are out there. We'll learn how critical community leadership drives equitable development. And we're gonna learn some about the real projects that are happening in Duluth. We definitely have time for Q&A generally at the end. And I'll show you, if you're not as familiar with this tool, how to enter those questions throughout the time frame. Um, and if speakers want to take questions during, they'll let me know and I'll make sure that I uh, facilitate those in. So today for our meeting, some of the really quick things I like to go over just so we have an effective meeting space. You know, if you can be on camera, absolutely um, do that. But also know that if you're having any issue hearing, um, hearing the, the presentations verbally, it does often help to turn off your video. We have everyone muted when you're coming in. So when we have that opportunity at the end, if anyone wants to verbalize questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. You have that capability. Um, and as far as how to utilize Zoom, lots of people are probably getting very familiar with this tool. Um, and so Carl, if you want to jump to the next slide. On that bottom, right side area you see the little chat box that's the most important piece and so if you have that ability to pop that open if you want to write your name and the organization that you're with feel free to do that let us know who's here and just make sure you know how to utilize that chat you can privately chat me um, questions if you have them or you can publicly chat it in that box to everyone i'll make sure to grab all questions that come uh, to the group and so first today, um, uh, the presenters that we have, our introduction of our presenting team, pop forward there, Carl. We have Carl Shuttler, who's on my team here at Norspan. He's our research director and consultant. He's gonna walk through what you might've forgot about Opportunity Zones, kind of a nice refresher today. We have Danielle from Whipley. She has been uh, the guru, not only in our state, but also across our country. She'll be giving us a great update on the final regulations and a, a guide to opportunity zones in general, where, where we landed. Um, a lot of people have been considering that this might be over and this tool is definitely not done. It's really worth looking at. We have with us uh, Pam and Lars from uh, Lisk Duluth here. And, and also Susan and Terry from Cogent Consulting, and they're gonna talk about what it means and how critical it is to have leadership um, and community leadership driving that equitable development in our communities and what that looks like. And then they are gonna talk through some real projects. We also have Adam from the City of Duluth joining us today to talk about some of those real projects that are happening uh, in the community of Duluth. And so first, I'm going to hand it off to Carl to talk through what it means to forget about who we are and what we're doing. So um, off to you, Carl. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. All right. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. It looks like we have great attendance. So looking forward to uh, having this presentation. We have a great line of speakers. And I'm hoping to hear from all of you as we go along here, through either questions as we go along in the chat box or the Q&A at the end. So just to give a quick overview of uh, the Minnesota Opportunity Collaborative is, this is a group that really emerged right, right after the, the Opportunity Zone, Zone Incentive was first created in early 2019 now, which seems like a long time ago, but um, at the time, you know, we recognized the importance of this tool and in uh, driving investment into the, the Opportunity Zones that we had designated in, in not only in Duluth, but across the state of Minnesota. And so we brought together a whole group of partners, ranging from investors, developers, businesses, a lot of community development people across the state, trying to get them onto a shared platform where we can work to advance uh, development in opportunity zones. And uh, we really had some several uh, intended social impacts along with this. So we're really looking to create jobs in these zones, many of which have suffered from historic disinvestment or 
lacked opportunity for the residents, trying to find ways to drive attainable housing into them, uh, create housing that meets the needs of the community, and just generally re revitalizing these areas. So uh, we're recognizing that this opportunity zones are a tool that can really move all, all of these goals along. Uh, Minapco team, uh, you met Alyssa a moment ago. Uh, she's our president and CEO here at Northspan, and then there's me, and then Laura Nilsson on our team is also on the call here today. Um, and we also like to thank all of our founding partners every time we do one of these. So thanks to Liz Duluth, who you'll hear from in a moment, uh, Liz Twin Cities, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation was a major funder through its uh, Opportunity Zone Fund. Also thanks to two state departments, the Department of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation and the Department of Employment and Economic Development, and to the Southwest Initiative Foundation. So a whole range of partners across the state helping to make this uh, program a reality. Uh, so there are really three main pieces to Monopco. First is statewide collaboration. Um, and this is really focused on you know, um, creating a shared space for people to come together and uh, drive investment into opportunity zones. So um, we have a, a bi-monthly webinar series that we revived earlier this year and we'll keep going through the end of the year. We have the next one coming up on August 25th at 1.30 p.m. And Danielle, who you'll hear from in a moment, will give an even longer version of her current presentation at that one. So if you really want to get into the details of uh, Opportunity Zones, that'll be a great opportunity on August 25th. And then we have a, a full schedule of events available on our website at binopco.com slash events. Uh, the second big piece of Binopco is education. If this one, uh, we're just trying to provide information, training, and resources to communities across the state, and you, you are in one of these events right now. You know, when we launched the Opportunity Collaborative, a lot of these were in-person events, but now we've shifted them to being virtual. We did one on, on the Iron Range about a month ago, and then we have another one lined up for Southwest Minnesota, and that one will be taking place on Monday, September 14th at 2 o'clock, and if you're in that part of the state, look for more details on that in, in the near future. And the, the final piece that we have is the directory. This is a place where we have compiling information on potential projects in opportunity zones. And we have a um, that you know, listing uh, give projects an opportunity to tell their story, explain why they are seeking investment, the community benefits they'll have, and we'll see some examples of what those look like here. But uh, an opportunity to really tell that story and uh, put their best foot forward to potential investors. And there, there are three, three different ways to add information to that directory. We do three, three different types of projects. One is a traditional real estate development. One is uh, an operating business seeking opportunities of investment. And uh, also just available properties that happen to be in opportunity zones that are seeking investments also. All of those can be put into the directory and we'd ha be happily help you get your projects uploaded if, if you need help, any help accessing those forms. Uh, all this is available from, on the Minopco website at minopco.com slash directory. So uh, without further ado, I think we'll move into the, uh, the meat of our presentation, get into some of our presenters. And our first presenter we have is Danielle Lewis, who is a CPA and senior tax manager at Whipley. And as Elissa mentioned, she's been our guru in uh, getting into some of the real details and regulations around opportunity zones. So I will turn it over to Danielle. Thank you. Okay, so you guys will just have to bear with me while I share my screen here. Okay, um, so just let me know if uh, you guys can see you on the screen. Um, but I think for today, kind of our main goal for us to go through is high level, you know, how opportunity zones work, how they're structured, and various aspects to know about them. Um, this particular slide deck is probably around 45 slides and normally takes about two hours to go through. Definitely not gonna do that today, um, but wanted to make sure that you know everyone could have access to this information. Um, so we're gonna just kind of focus on the high level stuff and perhaps some of the aspects that have changed um, due to COVID um, in some of those, those areas. Um, but, you know, to, to Carl and Alyssa's point, um, opportunity zones are still a very big thing uh, that we're seeing in the market. Um, I think in general, you know, with COVID, there has been more hesitation and everything to kind of move forward with 
any deals, let alone opportunity zone deals as well. But we, what we've also seen is a lot of people exiting the stock market um, and having gains um, because of being afraid to keep their money in the stock market or, or whatever. So we do um, kind of envision a lot of people in the next few months trying to figure out what to do with their gain um, that they had recognized. So I think we're expecting to see this continue um, throughout the years. You know, this is definitely not going away. Um, and we're all kind of very excited as this kind of grows and develops. Um, we finally have, you know, final regulations and good substantive information to work with. Um, so it's, it's a great time for people to start getting involved in it as well. Um, so a little background for, between, for me and kind of Whitley itself. Uh, so we're a national CPA firm. Um, I lead our Opportunity Zone group for the firm. Um, I've probably touched or helped set up probably around 60 to 70 different Opportunity Zone funds throughout the country. Uh, most of them centered around the Midwest as well as a lot in um, Denver, Colorado area and some in California as well. Um, you know, with Lee ourselves, we kind of go to market by industry. I, I have always worked in the construction real estate group, uh, which meant this was kind of a good pair um, for Opportunity Zones because at the onset, a lot of what we saw was a lot of real estate people kind of getting involved in Opportunity Zones. And I think as the information has solidified and businesses have figured out how to get involved, we've also seen a big influx of that. Um, in general, around Opportunity Zones, a lot of our problem really is that there's no data to collect around this. Um, so while we know people are creating opportunity zone businesses and everything else, that data is a lot harder for us to actually obtain. Um, because unlike real estate or something where you need a city approval to build a building or do some developments, uh, you know, an operating business doesn't necessarily have to go through that loophole. Um, so I think a lot of those kind of go under the radar and it's unless people are self-reporting their deals, we really don't hear about them as much. So it's harder to kind of track um, what operating deals are actually happening in the Qualified Opportunity Zone fund world, uh, perhaps versus a real estate deal. Um, and I think that's at least the, the data that I've seen from other places as well. Um, but sort of high level agenda, we're going to go through Opportunity Zones 101, uh, what they are, how they work, um, and then go through a few of the updates as well. Uh, so the main part of an Opportunity Zone, and a lot of times this is missed too when people kind of set up these funds, uh, is that you actually do need a capital gain to get the benefit of all um, the Opportunity Zone funds. So essentially what happens is you recognize some sort of capital gain. It can be through selling personal stock, selling a business, um, or selling real estate um, because that 1231 gain is considered a capital gain in the eyes of the Opportunity Zone. So you've got to have some sort of transaction to trigger a gain to either be an investor in a QF or start your own and get the Opportunity Zone benefits as well. Um, fortunately, there is no rule that you can just put cash in and not have that correlated gain. Um, and it, sometimes I think that is missed, so I just want to highlight that today for us. Um, the sale itself has to be, you know, from an unrelated party, you can't sell something to yourself or to your, your wife or something just to generate a fictitious gain, so to speak. Uh, but can kind of go from anywhere. And then you generally have 180 days starting from the transaction of the sale to invest in an Opportunity Zone fund. Um, so that's kind of the investor side of it. Um, the 180 days is really contingent upon various different factors. We have a slide later on that will kind of go through, hey, depending upon where the gain fr is from, this is when your 180 day time period starts. Um, it's definitely something I highly, re highly recommend whether or not you are the one starting the fund or you're, you as an investor is looking into opportunity zones is to kind of meet with your CPA or lawyer, you know, whoever, you know, that you know knows this information to make sure that you're going to meet that 180 day period and you understand kind of that window of time frame. Because there's, at this time, you know, not really much to fix in that area. I think there were a couple private letter rulings last year for when um, they got bad advice from their CPA and stuff. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a pretty hard and fast rule. So in general, Opportunity Zones are going to give you three different benefits. Um, like I said, you have to have that, that um, gain in order to get these benefits. Uh, but the first one is you get a temporary deferral of that gain. Um, 
and it is to the earlier of December 31st, 2026, or when you sell the investment. Uh, the second benefit is that you get a step up in basis in that original gain, uh, depending upon when you hold it. Uh, so if you hold that fund interest for a total of 10, uh, sorry, for a total of five years, you get 10% reduction. And if you hold it for a total of seven years, you get another five. Um, the, that 5% expired. So, you know, an investor would have already had to make their investment by 12, 31, 2019 to be eligible for that. Um, but that is important to note because a lot of people did start up their funds back in 2019 without much of a plan really on how to invest that cash. So there's actually a lot of people out there who have funds that are looking to find areas to actually invest in. Um, and then the final third benefit is the permanent exclusion. Um, and that's the real kind of incentive for people to do this. So if you hold that fund interest, then for a period of 10 years, uh, you can elect to have that gain essentially not taxable. Um, so that can be a, a huge, gigantic benefit um, to this whole thing. The temporary deferral and the basis step up, you know, are certainly great additions to it. Um, but, you know, if you have something that you put $100,000 in and then in, you know, 11 years, it's worth $500,000, that means that you get a not recognized gain on that $400,000. Um, it is, uh, Minnesota is uh, conforming to opportunity zone rules. Um, they do have a fixed date conformity. So, I, I, you know, I think as of right now, you're, you're good going forward. It's just some of the older ones that got a little funky, depending upon what year you had your gain. Um, so Minnesota is a great place to currently have Opportunity Zone deals um, because you get the benefit both at the state and federal level. Uh, here is just kind of an example of an investor, uh, you know, investment. Um, to kind of show both the benefits, this is, you know, a 2019 one, which I know is historically past us now. Uh, but I think it's a good way to illustrate both the 10% the step up and the 5% step up. So this is a person, they had a $1 million taxable gain. They put their money into a fund within the 180 day period. Um, because of how this fund structure works, and since you've paid no tax on it yet, uh, effectively your, your basis in that fund is going to be starting at zero. Um, so that's kind of an important note to keep track of as well. Um, so now we look, five years have passed. Uh, we're in 2024. Um, they get that 10% step up. Um, so now that $1 million gain is going to have a basis, um, you know, is going to be able to be reduced a little bit for the, the eventual gain recognition. And then in 2026, the investor has held it now for a total of seven years. And they will have increased their total basis um, 15%. Um, so essentially, if they, back in 2019, they were looking to pay tax on one million and now they're only going to have to pay tax on 850,000. Um, so that's a pretty significant difference um, but that's not you know even kind of the best part of the opportunity zone uh, but you can kind of see this highlighted here someone held that before that total seven years they're getting that total benefit now looking forward prospectively since it's impossible for someone to get the full 15 percent they can still get the 10 percent benefit and they would have saved themselves instead of a million dollars they're going to pay tax on 900,000. Um, but now looking forward to the original example, we've got 10 years down the road. Uh, they go to sell the fund for three million and they're not gonna pay any difference on the tax between the million dollars they invested and the three million here. So huge benefit uh, potential for a lot of different investors. Um, setting up the fund itself, it can be corporation, SRC, partnership, LLC. Um, I would say setting up the fund is very, very important. I've seen a lot of funds get set up incorrectly um, and they're pretty much impossible to fix um, once, once they're not set up right, depending upon the situation. Um, but generally what we see is most of them are set up in a partnership structure with a qualified opportunity zone fund itself on the top and, as, and then the qualified opportunity zone business, a partnership below it. Um, so always at least a two-tier process. And that's just due to the rules that they have in Opportunity Zones uh, are much more favorable when you have a two-tier structure. It's not impossible to make it work if your Opportunity Zone fund is the only entity, but it makes the testing requirements quite difficult. Um, and the reason for that is the next note. So an Opportunity Zone fund has to hold 90% of its assets as Qualified Opportunity Zone business property. 
uh, sorry, as qualified opportunities on property. Um, so this is going to either be another partnership interest, um, stock, um, or you know property itself. Um, so qualified opportunities on property. And the the issue that we run into there. So if if the qualified opportunities on fund owns the you know, um, hotel, say, or rental property or the business itself, they're always going to be subject to that 90% rule. So it makes it a lot harder to make sure that they're meeting that, where if they dropped it down into a qualified opportunity zone business, it's a whole different set of rules and it's much easier to meet. Um, but in general, we'll kind of go through these, these items. So if the qualified opportunity zone fund obtains partnership, uh, partnership interest or stock, uh, just has to meet these de designations essentially. Um, and then if it's investing into the property itself, uh, it has to be tangible property used in a trader business, uh, can't be really required acquired from a related party, um, and has to be acquired after December 31st, 2017. Um, you know, back a few years ago, this was probably the biggest issue that Opportunity Zones faced is how someone who had a existing property in a qualified opportunity zone could benefit from the QOF rules. Um, there's a few uh, ways you can kind of get around it that we've now learned through the final regs, um, but it does require a lot of strategic planning um, and setup to, in order to get that to work. Um, so qualified opportunity zone business. So this is gonna be when the fund owns a partnership or stock interest below it. Um, and we can kind of see how these rules are going to vary a little bit. So uh, there's a few different tests that the Qualified Opportunity Zone business has to meet. Um, so the biggest one is the business tangible property, 70% has to be Qualified Opportunity Zone business property. So those are going to be the rules we kind of just mentioned. Uh, it has to be acquired after December 31st, um, 2017. It's going to either have to be original use or substantially improved. Um, but you can see the big variance here is that 70%. Um, so if the, if essentially, if the QOF holds it, it has to meet that 90%. Um, but since it's a qualified opportunity zone business, only 70% of the tangible property actually has to meet that requirement. Um, next, um, you know, a substantial portion of the intangible property has to be used for trader business use. I've never really come across this as a problem yet, um, but the, the regulations define that as 40%. Um, another item is a uh, test that they have to meet is less than 5% of the average uh, aggregate unadjusted basis can be attributed to non-qualified financial property. Um, and so what that really means is they're going to be looking at, um, you know, non-cash, cash equivalent type things, debt longer than 18 months um, that, that this qualified opportunity zone business is holding. So essentially what they wanted to prevent here is they don't want a qualified opportunity zone business that's going to be doing a bunch of outside investing with their other cash. Um, they, so they don't want it owning like another partnership interest, not a QOZ. They don't want it to own, you know, a bunch of long-term maturities. They essentially just want to make sure that the cash that's meant to be developing um, an opportunity zone is being used to develop an opportunity zone, which is a really great you know, thing to make sure that they're having the funds have ownership of. Um, so that's what that 5% rule is really trying to prevent there. Um, and then another kind of test is at least 50% of the gross income has to be derived from an active trader business. Uh, when we first started Opportunity Zone funds, uh, this was really hard to understand what the IRS meant um, or what Treasury meant. Um, so it was in the regulations that they had released that they finally defined what this meant and they further clarified them in the final regulations that came out at the end of the year as well. Uh, so this is hugely beneficial and these rules really help clarify um, how a trader business can be in a qualified opportunity zone and meet this requirement. Um, and they're pretty gracious. Um, so there are three rules here. So essentially 50% of the services performed by the business um, has to occur in the zone or um, or 50% of the services based on hours um, have to be in the zone, or they have another role kind of for like more of a management company that's maybe doing some of their management activity, but you know, they're going out somewhere. So I think the example in the regulations is a landscaper, for example. You know, I think that was a lot of big questions. Like if, if the primary, primary use of your services are outside of a zone, and that's something you can't control, 
um, should a business really be prohibited from being a QOF? Um, and this rule kind of tells you how you'd eventually meet there, um, which is quite good to know. I think I have a few clients who kind of met that safe harbor three versus the other two. And additionally, so these are safe harbors. So these are the IRS saying like, hey, if you meet these qualifications, you're definitely most more likely than not good. Uh, but they also have the facts and circumstances too, which is essentially like, if you can justify your situation and how it works, then that's an acceptable method as well. And I have at least um, one or two clients who kind of fit that bucket as well. Definitely don't fit the safe harbors, but their intent and how they're working within the zone um, meets the intent of the regulations themselves. Um, a, a couple of big things with opportunity zones, you just can't have any sin businesses. So this is gonna be massage parlors, golf courses, liquor stores and casinos. Um, I think they just wanted to make sure that the money was going to something that would develop um, that community and area. Um, so a lot of these are kind of big rules around um, how the qualified opportunity zone business itself works. Uh, one of those big rules is the working capital safe harbor. Um, so all qualified opportunity zone businesses, what's going to happen with them is they're going to get a bunch of cash from the QOF. So say you have about, you know, 10 investors who each put in, you know, $10 million, the QOF is going to drop that down to the QOZB. Now the QOZB has got a ridiculous amount of cash. Um, and so the IRS kind of set around guidelines on how you can expend that cash and what timeline there is for that. Um, so they created this working capital safe harbor um, to ensure that you're not you know, disqualifying yourself with that 5% non-qualified financial property rule we discussed um, a couple slides ago. Um, and it's essentially any of this cash in this working capital safe harbor will not account against you for the testing requirements as long as it's designated in writing, uh, it's kind of in a schedule, and you know, you, you're, you're as consistent as you can be with those schedules as well. Um, certainly with COVID, a lot of my clients' schedules have changed significantly um, and not due to anything they could have controlled. Um, but it's, it's just really important that you know, if you're having a qualified opportunity zone business, whether or not it's real estate or an operational business itself, is that this is actually done. Um, you know, this is the thing that's going to save every QOZB to ensure and show the IRS that they, you know, indeed had the intent of whatever they're kind of making, uh, especially as, you know, times right now are a little more up in the air. You know, we, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy or anything else. Um, so I think having this documentation is very important. And a lot of people I work with uh, don't realize that this is something that they should be doing. Um, so I just kind of want to point it out uh, that essentially this is going to be how their plan on how they're expending the cash and what they're going to do with it. Um, there's different rules for the different cash flows. And additionally, there's some COVID um, provisions that have extended this as well that I'll get to shortly. Um, so just let me take a moment while I go through some of these slides. Um, uh, a big rule, if we're looking particularly at real estate, um, is if you buy a piece of, um, if you buy a building, um, you know, it, and it's used, it has to be substantially improved. Um, so essentially what that means is you have to double down the basis in that building in a period of 30 months. Um, and that's the thing that I think also uh, has been missed in a lot of people that I've kind of started working with, um, or they buy a building and they realize that there's no way they can actually do that many improvements in that short of a time, or not that short of time span. The building was maybe just too new, or there's just legitimately not that many th different things to change. Um, so that's a very important piece of buying real estate in uh, QSEs. You have to make sure that you can really double down that basis. Um, so that does not include any land value. Um, so you're going to subtract that generally from the whole, you know, substantial improvement piece. But um, so it's very important to get an appraisal of the land and everything else, particularly if your land value is higher um, and, you know, you need something to kind of justify what that is. Um, so they've either got to have that substantial improvement or um, it's got to be original use. Um, so that could be, you know, you do ground up construction, you bought a piece of land. Or it could be you buy a building before it was ever used by someone else in that zone. Um, so I think we I've seen a few situations where people, um, a building was under development, there was no certificate of occupancy received yet, and the, the qualified opportunity zone fund uh, had bought it 
um, before it was really placed into service. And that is another thing that counts as well. Um, and kind of like I said earlier, a lot of these slides, uh, it would take me two hours to get through this. Um, definitely don't want to take up that much time going through it. Uh, so I'm going to kind of page through these a little quick. Um, this area kind of just talks about the various different gains that you can put in an Opportunity Zone Fund. Um, prior to the final regulations came out, there was a lot of controversial rules around 1231, and 1231 is really selling um, property use in a trader business. The rules previously in the, the proposed regulations were really unfavorable and added a lot of complexity. Uh, thankfully, the final regulations changed that and they generally adopt the same 180 day rules as any other capital gain. Um, here is kind of a um, outline of the different 180 days that you have. Um, so if the gain is coming from a partnership um, or S Corp, something that would come on a K1 essentially, you either have 100 days from the day of the sale, 180 days from the entity's tax year, or uh, 180 days from the due date of the tax return before extensions. Um, so that's like three big possibilities to kind of and flexibility to really do that. And that was kind of feedback the IRS got from a lot of people who got K1s, I think in prior years being like, okay, well now I've already missed my 180 days. It would have been great if I could have known this ahead of time and deferred some of this gain into an opportunity zone fund. Uh, they also clarified how an installment sale worked. Um, I think prior to the final regs, there was a lot of discussion around whether or not an installment sale that existed prior to December 2017 would really qualify as something that you could defer into an opportunity zone fund. And thankfully, they did clarify that that does count. Um, so I've worked on a few deals where people were in the situation, maybe they finally had you know, their big payments coming through for their installment sales, but they were you know, ridiculously old. Um, and they were able to take that money that they received and invest it uh, into a QOF. Um, let's see. Otherwise, they did clarify a lot of exit strategies. So initially when opportunity zones came out, there wasn't a lot of flexibility in how you got out of the qualified opportunity zone fund. Uh, because all of the rules and everything, they do not relate to necessarily the property or the operation that exists. It 100% relates back to your fund interest in itself. So a lot of people were concerned, you know, about, hey, if I bought a building in my QOZB, what, what really happens with that? I'm not selling my QOF interest, I'm selling the property itself and how all those kind of things would come in and whether or not you know new investors would want to buy an LLC interest versus the building and the kind of weight that comes with you know acquiring a, a used LLC so to speak. Um, so thankfully the IRS came up and Treasury came out with much favorable rules on how you eventually exclude those gains after 10 years. Um, so we have much much better guidance on that and much more flexibility which has helped out a lot. Um, Otherwise, you know, in the final regulations, there were a lot of updates with real estate and how you kind of treat that, um, as well as a lot of around that working capital safe harbor. And additionally, um, I believe it was in April, they released a bunch of corrections around the final regulations themselves, and they actually had pretty substantial corrections. Uh, typically, when we see corrections, it's kind of spelling errors or, you know, small grammatical changes. Um, but they actually, you know, added some examples and everything to these corrections, which um, were a good addition uh, to highlight a few of these where they clarified some of the language um, for, you know, a cure period. Um, they also kind of went through a better explanation on how tangible property is treated during the working capital safe harbor period. Uh, which was a lot of questions that people really had because we weren't really sure how to do those tests. Um, finally, my kind of last slide here is opportunity zones and how they were affected by COVID. Um, so in notice 2020-39, they went through various different kind of extensions or provisions um, related to opportunity zones that were caused due to COVID. Uh, so one of the big ones was uh, extending the 180 day period for people. Um, you know, if that 180 day period was kind of in between these dates, um, they now have until December 31st, 2020 to invest their capital gains into a QOF. 
so that's really great. Um, I, you know, I have many clients who are actually utilizing this extra time period to find a good investment um, for their, for themselves or perhaps for their clients themselves in the situation of some lawyers. Um, they also kind of alleviated the worry of if you failed your test. So QOF maybe doesn't have anywhere to put their cash or their deals fell through. Um, they would not be subject to a, ten, a penalty because they weren't able to drop down their cash into a qualified opportunity zone business by the either June 30th testing date or December 31st testing date. Um, they also said that the 31 month sub substantial improvement period is told um, from April 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. So that pretty much means you still have 30 months. You just get to subtract these months from that total substantial improvement time, which is definitely needed uh, for a lot of communities, um, especially like on the East Coast that weren't really able to move forward with that. Um, otherwise, they also tacked on some additional working capital safe harbor months, as long as the cash is in that QOZB by the end of the year. So an additional 24 months, uh, which can be huge. So you got 31 months now plus 24. Um, so the IRS Treasury were, you know, pretty quick to react to this and as far as QOF and helped a lot of taxpayers with this. Um, so that's kind of all my presentation here on Opportunity Zones kind of 101. Um, otherwise, I think this slide deck will be kind of shout out to anyone, but feel free to reach out to me with any questions as well. Thank you, Danielle. We do have one question. Probably you might be the best to see if you can answer it. So I'll ask him now. Um, good, question, good question around Opportunity Zone data, and if you've been able to get anything from the Treasury IRS, like what are they gathering if they're making anything public? Um, yeah, I've never seen any data from the government. The only thing that I've seen is from uh, Novogratic, another CPA firm who kind of specializes in these niche markets. Um, so I think they produce some content out there regarding how many self-reporting funds um, exist and what data they can get. But as far as I know, any data that's out there is 100% self-reported. But it would be, I, I mean, from the data the IRS is getting and the checkboxes people have to do to submit their returns, I would assume the IRS could technically report that, but there's nothing formal that I'm aware of or that they're coming out with, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Uh, that's the only question we have right now, but remember, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. You can chat them um, privately to me, Elissa Norspan, or you can put them out there for the public and I'll send it back to Carl. All right, so just uh, quickly share our screen, but our next presenter will be uh, Pam Kramer and Lars Kuhner from Liz Bluth and Susan Hale and Terry Burrow from Coaching Consulting and we'll be uh, rolling into our next session which talks about how critical community leadership can drive equitable de development and really focusing on how we can take this incentive and put it to work in our communities, particularly in Duluth. So uh, we'll turn it over to the Liz Duluth and Coaching Consulting teams. Well, thank you. I'm Pam Kramer, and I'm just uh, waiting to make sure that we're all set here, but we are. Um, I'm Pam Kramer. I'm the executive director of, of LISC in Duluth, and uh, have been working on Opportunity Zones as a new addition to the work that we've been doing at LISC um, ever since, really, the legislation was passed. Uh, right away, our national organization looked at um, how can we uh, be working uh, to bring this new, new tool to our communities. Um, LISC is uh, the nation's largest uh, community development intermediary. We're a CDFI, and we have uh, been in Duluth for 23 years. Um, our mission is working with residents and partners. We forge uh, resilient and inclusive communities uh, of opportunity across the country and, and really work with the community, uh, businesses, residents, city, um, all the public sector and with the private sector to create great places to live, work, visit, do business, and raise families. So a, a new strategy for us was uh, working with Opportunity Zones. 
And I'm, thank you. So <laughs> a little background. Um, and I have to admit, um, I lost my notes as we were preparing for this. So I'm struggling a little bit here, but our, as an introduction, um, we're really working together to take advantage of the Opportunity Zone at financing as a new tool. Uh, we're excited to be a partner in this effort and um, this um, webinar, and we, we really need to thank um, the, oppor the Minnesota Opportunity Zone uh, Collaborative uh, for being a, being a part of this from the very beginning. I also need to uh, provide thank you to the Bush Foundation uh, for a community innovation grant that we are kicking off in partnership with uh, Cogent Consulting and in partnership with the entire community uh, to allow us to build capacity in Duluth. Uh, the five neighborhoods that we're working in are neighborhoods that LISC um, or three neighborhoods and five census tracts or neighborhoods we've worked in in the past. And we wanna thank the Bush Foundation and also thank the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation uh, for support that they're providing uh, to LISC in this work. Um, a little background on us again, we support community engagement strategies, we build connections between our investors and, and specific Opportunity Zone projects. And we're promoting Opportunity Zone opportunities uh, as a way to uh, recover and, and deal with the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic and, and bring our neighborhoods and community back. So uh, also a key part of, of what we do is we're a part of a national organization and people could go to uh, www.list.org and just look for opportunity zones. There's an entire toolkit and information that's available from our national organization. So with that, I'm going to um, uh, invite Susan Hamill to uh, join me in, in this presentation. Great, thank you so much, Pam. Uh, we're seeing each other a lot on Zoom these days. Um, <laughs> so I guess that's the way of the world. Um, my name is Susan Hamill, and I'm the founder and CEO of Cogent Consulting. Um, we are Liz Deleuze, um Social Impact Investing Advisor. Uh, we are based in the Twin Cities. We're a national firm uh, doing strategic financial advice uh, to help people do good well. Um, we advise a lot of foundations, nonprofits, and for-profit funds and businesses who are seeking to both um, make money, so marry profit, and, and purpose, and a social impact. You know, and, and personally, um, we really wish we could be with you all in person. Um, I want to say I'm very proud on our team. Uh, we actually have a UMD grad. So yay, Akua, maybe um, give a thumbs up or something. Uh, Akua Kanadu, it's, we, we are really hoping we could be up in Duluth. Um, but you know, the other thing is for the last two years, our, our firm, we've been burning up the miles on 35, uh, coming to Duluth at the request of Pam, but also your, your wonderful philanthropic um, community, uh, Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, but also Ordeen Foundation, Northland. Um, so I've had a chance to get to know some of you and I look forward to, to getting to know you all better. So our, our work with, with, with your team, um, with List Duluth, is to really support and enhance their work on Opportunity Zones by really taking this hybrid approach where we're marrying profit and purpose. So you just heard Danielle um, give that Bravo performance on the rules and the regulations about opportunity zones. That was all the financial part, right? So the big takeaway is that these projects have to be financially viable, right? I, you probably all caught that, that in order to get that, if you invested a hundred, you know, thousand dollars and then it grows to value of five hundred thousand dollars and not paying tax on the four hundred thousand dollar gain. Well, that assumes a successful project. <laughs> so these um, these zone projects really have to be they don't have to be risk free, but they have to be pretty solid. 
And that could be with um, philanthropic or government subsidy to help take a project to make it more financially viable. Um, or it could just be those projects that are almost market rate, but not quite. So that's the financial takeaway. What we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes here with um, Terry Barrero, who's a principal at our firm, we're really gonna talk about what about that social impact side? Is that even possible in an opportunity zone? So as Pam said, the Bush Foundation, uh, we, we proposed that we wanted to try to see if that's possible here in Duluth. Can we marry profit and purpose in your five contiguous opportunity zones? Well, in order to do that, we just heard Danielle talk about the financial requirements, but what about the community? What about their voice? When do they, how do they engage in all this? It sounds pretty complicated, right? So lots to figure out there. So we've developed some tools for Pam and her team to use um, to, to make it really possible for people who live and work in these zones to actually benefit from the projects. And, and I say, um, you know, Minnesota, we're all pretty modest. And I think you get out of the Twin Cities and you might get even more modest. But I'll say, as I've said nationally, um, Duluth could be the example for the country of doing opportunity zones right, marrying financial viability, so good, strong investment with that positive social impact. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, my esteemed colleague, Terry Barrero. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here this afternoon. I wanna focus today on um, the challenges of Opportunity Zone projects. And they really have two parts to them. One of them is that every deal is very complicated because there are multiple institutions and then you lay over all the laws and expectations and regulations that the Opportunity Zone legislation has described. Um, and so each deal is unique and you marry that to the expectations the community has for what could happen in their community with either um, accessible housing or new business development or multi-use projects. And um, it, it becomes very complicated. What we're working with LIST to do is to, to put together tools. And the next slide gives you a couple, an example of that. We want to help. We, we want to be able to identify all the players in these projects. So first, we'd look at the uh, people who are involved in the development of a specific project. We look to see um, in each project who is involved and um, what roles should they be playing or are they playing in that project. We also took a look at what was the original intention of the Opportunity Zone legislation. And that original intention was to have a social impact on the community by creating accessible housing, by creating jobs that were available to people in the community and by enhancing the community around that project or even in the project. So we've added an additional set of expectations for the players. So not only is it let's put money on the table and let's make sure the bricks and mortar work and let's make sure that the building is sound and compliant with what is an expectation for those buildings, but let's also look at the roles they should be playing to make sure that these kinds of social impact outcomes that we want are going to happen and that um, the kind of positive change we want to see in the communities happen. So this is a, this is a quick overview of the kinds of ex both who all the players are and the kinds of expectations we have for them. A lot of this work has come from uh, some great leadership put together by the um, a, a research that was done by the Beck Center at Georgetown and the US Impact Investing Alliance along with the New York Fed. And they looked and asked the question, what really should we be doing for ensuring that the community impact, the social impact we're looking for 
really can happen. They identified two key guidelines. One of them is that there is honest community engagement through direct relationships in partnership with the community development organizations that are in those local neighborhoods. And if there don't exist, working directly with the community residents and business owners. And secondly, to make sure that that engagement includes real diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies so that people who often are excluded from those community project conversations are included honestly. The second is that there is clear outcomes about what is a project's intended impact on the community and how will the community know and the project developers know that those impacts are actually happened. So uh, in housing projects, if there is a commitment for affordable housing, what is the definition of that commitment and how will it actually occur and who's going to monitor to make sure that happens? So this, this chart and the next slide shows you the key players and the kind of roles they play. Each of them has an element to contribute. Each of them has a way to be able to help ensure that the full impact integrity of a project can happen. So Cogent is working closely with uh, Duluth Lisk, or Lisk Duluth, sorry, I'm used to the old name. Uh, and the next slide shows you uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle. So for each project that Lisk Duluth is working on, they're creating this blueprint for who are the, all of the different players that were shown on the previous two slides. And what roles are they playing to make sure that um, they have the kind of community impact that should happen? And if there are some missing players, Duluth, Lisk and their partners can be able to go and identify potential additional players to help make that happen. Danielle Lewis spoke a lot about the kind of um, roles and expectations that are placed on a lot of these pieces of the puzzle. And so you need a lot of this combination of experts and finance and community engagement to make one of these projects really work right. And as Danielle also said, there's a lack of data. And so one of the roles that LISC Duluth and LISC locations around the country are, are stepping forward to, it, to, to play is to collect the data about their projects so we can begin to aggregate what really is the community impact that's happening in opportunity zones in our own local communities. Uh, next slide points to the other half of it. So the first, the last three slides I've been talking about, how do they make sure that the right players are there and they know they have a responsibility and a commitment for listening to the community and for guaranteeing imp the impact that they intend. The other side of that is that these projects need to listen to the community. They need to be able to hear the voices of the community and listen to them honestly and to do it with ec equity and inclusion values in place. Um, and they need to respond to the voices that are raised by the community in a way that honestly creates a positive impact in the community. That the impact is framed and named and that the, there's a way that the progress on that impact intention is shared publicly. And that the way that it's measured and reported makes sense. Now a lot of these projects have government funding tied to them and in order to get government dollars there is always a, a requirement of clarity of effect of um, who's being hired, who's moving into the housing, is, it, is the housing going to be affordable in the community, et cetera. So in some ways, is if there's government dollars involved with it, you already have that kind of um, guarantee. But we are looking also for other kinds, of, other kinds of strategies that make sure that if the community wants clear green space, that it's still going to be there and they're going to be, the project will be held accountable for that. And the next slide I want to talk about is Ev is talking about this sort of the investor world and the community engagement world and, and, and these projects marry those two worlds and figure out how to get them talking to each other. But as we've begun to, uh, Cogent and Liz Duluth have begun to move down this road, we realize that they're very 
two very different kinds of culture. The community engagement work is open conversations. They tend to be discussion intensive, and if you're sitting in the room, it might be really confusing because you're hearing conflicting ideas and different kinds of perspectives on what's important. Um, the conversations and that whole discussion process can be very time consuming. And that the kinds of things that communities say they need may not be contributing to the value, the resale value of the, of the project um, and the value that is important for the investors so that they can get their funds and, and back in a way that they get the tax implications. On the flip side, the developer and the investor world are closed. Until a project is fully formed and fully funded, it's pretty quiet. It's not something that's public about what all the steps are and who the players are. People who are investors tend to prefer not to, not to show their cards uh, until it's very clear that they're going to jump in. And even then, it, oftentimes they'd rather be an anonymous participant. Um, the language of the investment and developer world excludes lay people. Lots and lots of complex vocabulary, financial vocabulary, legal, legal vocabulary, tax vocabulary that is not accessible to people who don't spend lots of days working on it. Um, and so the, um, and then multiple institutions have different kinds of requirements. So as soon as you get into the conversation about a specific project, those requirements and expectations step in and make the conversation even more complex. So you have an open, um, time consuming, lots of, lots of different kinds of language on the one side and a closed, private, don't tell anybody kind of conversation on the other with the community priority being make my home and community a better place for me to live and for my family to grow and for an employer making my business grow in this community. And on the other side, it really is much more about how can we make this project viable? How can the investor get their get return on their investment? So that's where Duluth Lisk steps in. Next. So I'm going to turn it back to Pam for her to talk about the role they're playing, Liz Duluth is playing in helping to manage this conversation. You're muted, Pam. I'm sorry. Okay, I love this slide. It tells the story of um, how it really, as Terry said, we are bridging. LISC is working to be the bridge between the communities that are involved in and committed to and looking for potential projects and developers and, and investors who are also uh, working to make a difference in the community. Uh, they also want to ensure that it's a good investment. And um, there's a lot, as Terry outlined, there, there's differences uh, in, in the way they communicate and the way that they operate. So LISC is working um, with residents and partnerships, and we're bridging the two very different institutions. We're partnering with local community organizations and developers and have done that for many, many years as an investor and as a uh, source of, of uh, working at the neighborhood level uh, to address community needs. And we're offering uh, capital uh, as well as uh, connections to neighborhood-based organizations that operate in those neighborhoods. So for for opportunity zones, we have uh, five neighbor, five census tracts, three neighborhoods. We're working with the community development organizations that are active in those neighborhoods to ensure that, that they're at the table. And so that's equilibrium three. We've got Jody Slick and Shannon um, Lang here from equilibrium three for Lincoln Park. Tony Cuneo and Amy Demmer. Uh, in the hillside and downtown neighborhood. And Janet Kennedy um, 
as the chair of the board of the, the river um, front development organization, which is the CDC in West Duluth. Those are our key partners. And I think those are the important partners uh, and we will be turning it over to uh, who are committed to working with us. And we're gonna turn it over to uh, Lars to talk a little bit about some deals underway in Duluth. Good afternoon. So on the screen, we see that we have uh, 14 possible deals in our pipeline and we've been trying to track as best we can uh, deals that we think have a possibility. Uh, scale and range from dollar value, 35 million to $1 million. Uh, the change of environment, uh, we had some concerns about energy around getting deals done. And uh, we're finding out that energy is good and deals are still happening. So that's uh, really reassuring. Uh, deadlines have been extended, so we have some more time to get some things done. So here we go to the next slide. Uh, what we also uh, want everyone to know that even though we deal with the public, we understand that deals are proprietary, uh, deals have competitors. Uh, our side on the community engagement side is working with the community, but on, when we're working with developers, uh, we want uh, developers to know that uh, they have needs and we're going to respect those needs and uh, make sure that there's lots of communication. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here's the map. Uh, we're going to, I think Adam is going to share a deal uh, later specific to Duluth. Uh, we have a deal that I'm going to just quickly go through to kind of show the possibility of capital stack. Uh, it's a $23 million deal in Washington, D.C. Uh, LISC uh, put in $10.5 million. Uh, opportunity zones were about $2.8 million. Uh, we put in $500,000 of equity a million seven in a pre-development loan, $8 million in new market tax credits. Uh, we helped, uh, we provided technical assistance for uh, the developer to find another $700,000. And uh, we deployed $250,000 of credit enhancement, uh, all equaling about $10.5 million on a $23 million deal. So uh, we, can, uh, we can help, we have lots of expertise we have uh, lots of resources for capital, different ways to package things. And so we're, we're glad to help. Next slide, please. So the whole goal is creating wins for the community. We want to attract capital into parts of our community that maybe don't necessarily uh, organically attract capital. And so incentivizing, uh, bringing some expertise connecting to the community. Those are all things that we uh, can add to a project working with uh, both the developer and, and the community. And so uh, that bridge uh, slide is a really great presentation of, of how we do our work. Next slide, please. So we have capital. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, Debt capital, we have uh, access to other types of capital. Uh, our lending limit is really about $5 million per project. We love to partner, and that includes working with uh, community banks, uh, you know, taking some of the risk, maybe uh, different types of risks. We have some niche lending that we can do, um, all to uh, get deals done. That's our goal. Next slide, please. And is, I think this is a transition. It is, okay. So I think this is Adam. All right, thanks Lars. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Fulton. I am the Deputy Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of Duluth. And I'm just going to spend just, you know, a couple minutes here running through um, some projects. Um, Lars uh, actually previewed um, my next slide, but I just want to point out while we're looking at this picture, you know, we use this for all our PowerPoints in the city and it's a nice picture of Canal Park. 
Um, Canal Park is, is in our opportunity zone designation, and this is really great for us in many ways. Um, because this is a, a really great area, um, it's, it's an important real estate within the city of Duluth. Um, but it's also not necessarily where we'd like to steer some of that more socially driven investment. So um, moving on to, to look at what um, our opportunity zone designations look like. Uh, we had five census tracts designated in Duluth. And, uh, they, you know, they, they run the gamut mostly in built up parts of our community. Um, you know, the one thing that, that has been a challenge for us as a practical matter uh, is where we ended uh, the zone that's, that's furthest west. And if you can see, if you squint there, um, the westerly border um, on the left side of your screen is Central Avenue. We have a number of locations on the west side of that where we just wish those were in and they're not. Um, and it's something that, that we're continuing to track even as we work hard to make sure we have sites that are within the, the designated zones that, that are viable and, and can move forward. We were lucky early in the process to have strong partnership with Duluth LISC and Northspan, which allowed us to create this Duluth Opportunity Zone portal. And uh, this has been imperative for us to be able to steer potential investors to have a, a graphical means to look at the big picture. You know, what does Duluth look like? These are people who maybe haven't invested in Duluth before, and they need a way to understand the overall investment uh, situation in Duluth and how that might allow them to proceed with a project that's going to meet some of our goals and meet some of their goals. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly about a couple different projects. Um, this is the Board of Trade Building, and I'm excited that it's currently under uh, restoration. Uh, this is a building that uh, was targeted for a long time for some sort of reinvestment, and uh, it took um, a number of years to figure out exactly how that should proceed. Um, we were lucky to have a group out of Chicago, the Dubin Guru Group, that bought this building and really were uh, willing to very patiently work with the city of Duluth to figure out something that would work well and, and function both for the community and for Duluth's downtown. Um, it's a complicated building. It's a historic building. It doesn't have any parking. Um, they bought this building and, and shortly thereafter, we adopted a new standard that requires project labor agreements when we have tax increment financing. And uh, while what we found following adoption of that project labor agreement requirement is that projects really go well when they have project labor agreements, that was something that made people nervous at first. And so we were very grateful uh, to the Dubin Guru Group for their willingness to, to patiently um, try to figure this out. And the, um, you know, Lars spent a minute talking about capital stacks. This was a really complicated financing um, for this project. Um, we're grateful to many partners who participated, both with the developer and with the city, to try to figure out how to do this. Um, it has tax increment financing, and that ultimately was something that was very important to bring in to fill a gap that we just couldn't find another source to address. Um, this was a historic building, and, and we're excited to say that it's, it's you know, being restored. Um, we've got this commercial space on the first level where we've lost some very beloved tenants in Duluth uh, during the construction process, but we're very excited to have modernized commercial space on First Street, uh, which in Duluth there isn't much of. First Street is up from our main drag on, on Superior Street, and so um, when you get up to that block, there just aren't many opportunities for people to find that modernized space. Um, we were uh, fortunate to be able to utilize some EPA brownfield revolving loan funds to help uh, address some environmental remediation that was needed inside the building. And then obviously the Opportunity Zone investor equity that, that came in. Um, we had uh, some long conversations about how to make all this work. And, uh, you know, it caused the closing to be delayed a few times, but, but we got there. And I'm really happy to say it's been under construction for a while. And this is just a view of one of the apartments. Um, what, what we're finding is that even though we have this COVID emergency, housing demand in Duluth is still really very high. Our apartment vacancy rate is low. Our uh, vacancy rate for downtown apartments that are especially modern downtown apartments, um, you know, the, the vacancy rate is, is very, very low. And so this building is not done and they're already experiencing leasing rates that substantially exceed what, what was initially projected. So really excited to see this moving forward and have this building occupied in a viable way. And it's bumpy. We're still working through things like 
the parking issue and trying to make sure the developer is comfortable with the different parking scenarios that are possible. In Duluth, we don't require parking in our downtown, uh, but we also recognize that we have a, a relatively small downtown and, and uh, transit service that doesn't run 24 hours. And so uh, we need to make sure that those residents have viable means to get around. Uh, as we continue to, to work towards um, you know, what we hope is a downtown where maybe you don't need a car at some point in time. COVID has had an impact on the project. And, and I mentioned it didn't really have an impact on the apartments segment. It seems like that hasn't been an issue. It has had an impact on commercial. Um, the commercial lease up, I think there's a little bit of uncertainty. And uh, so that hasn't, hasn't moved as fast, but I'm still getting very positive feedback about those spaces. Moving on, I'm just gonna show a picture of a project that hasn't moved forward. So, so Board of Trade is, is under construction. This is a project where uh, this is located adjacent to our medical district, immediately across the street from the Vision Northland Essentia Hospital project. And Essentia is under construction. This site has not moved forward quite as quickly. And I think it's a, it's a good example of a site that has, I think probably fewer complexities than trying to redevelop a historic building but additional complexities because it's a bigger project. It is a project that is, um, you know, I think it's a little bit over $70 million in total and requires a uh, level of additional investment um, that we have to figure out exactly how to place it, make sure all the investors are confident. And so what, what has been encouraging about this, however, is that we have a developer who's dedicated to the city of Duluth, sufficiently dedicated that even though they haven't figured every last detail out, um, they've closed on the property. They're ready to go. They've made that commitment to move this project forward. We're continuing to work with them closely. And actually, I'm pretty optimistic we're going to see some activity there very soon. But, um, you know, of course, don't want to get into the details. Um, this project, one of the complexities is that, that we've talked about commercial space. And the other project was a mixed-use deal as well. Um, in this case, the goal was to have a grocery store. And so what we've found is that in a downtown, a smaller downtown like Duluth, um, figuring out how to do a grocery store where you don't have that really high level of residential density already can be a challenge. And so that's something the developer continues to work through, coming up with multiple scenarios for backup of, of what the next steps might be um, as we seek to finalize that lease of the commercial space. Oh, okay. So then on that last picture there, what I wanted to just spend a second talking about were some of the other challenges. I, I thought Terry from Cogent did a great job of talking about um, the complexity of these sites. In Duluth, all of our opportunity zone sites are in redevelopment areas. And so whether it's dealing with some contamination, whether it's dealing with complicated land use issues or modifications to utilities, projects are taking a while. And so setting this up is uh, important to be realistic up front and knowing that we have certain timelines we're trying to meet with the opportunity zone program um, mean that you really have to be upfront and, and careful about how you set forth your, your timing on projects. And I think that that also ties back to how projects are financed. The overall financing, as, as I mentioned on Board of Trade, that closing was moved a few times. Um, opportunity zones are still a newer financial product and not everyone uh, in the world who does um, financing for real estate projects has dealt with it so far. And so I think recognizing that there's a bit of education needed sometimes is something to um, be upfront about. I've shown you two residential projects. We're working hard in the city of Duluth to try to think about how we can get some opportunities on investment in commercial uh, and, and other business related types of projects. Um, that's something that we, we see as a real opportunity and, and something that uh, within the areas that we've designated, uh, we have just some great sites for that type of investment for commercial manufacturing, other business investment. And so we're continuing to work with partners to make sure that the education is out there about that. And then I just want to emphasize, as we're looking at this, site development is really critical. The site development process um, can take time. The entitlements can take time. And, um, you know, it's, it's really getting to what Terry talked about, that, that we want to make sure that we're really communicating uh, as much as possible to make sure these things work well. So thank you. That's uh, what I had today. Right. Thank, Thank you, Ann. And I'm going to do a couple of just quick wrap ups for, for LISC. Uh, following up on Adam, we can get the slides back up. Thank you. I think 
we have a next step slide. And I think what's so important is what Susan said at the beginning. This is, Duluth can be a model. And when, when you listen to what Adam shared with us, when you look at uh, the partnerships that we have in this community, when you look at um, the opportunities we have, we can make a difference. And, and our next steps really um, with, with LISC's work um, with the Opportunity Zone projects is to keep working with all of you and connect more. And, and uh, initially, uh, what we're committed to is, and, and continuing to be committed to, is assessing each project for its social impact working with community engagement um, and making sure that the community is fully at the table helping um, to identify priorities and and uh, helping us find matches and, and and projects that that will fit those priorities and we'll be looking at the impact of of the project on the community uh, and finding ways that that we can make improvements and and bring people together um, and and conducting assessments that'll be shared with the with the partners. So really uh, playing that role of, of a bridge. And connecting is is critical. We're going to be putting together a uh, advisory committee that will be looking at projects and also trying to uh, uh, match uh, projects with with community needs as well as identify social impact investors. So uh, for people who are interested and live in or engaged in one of the neighborhoods, contact us about uh, being a partner in that. And if you're interested as an investor, as Lars said, we have projects and we're looking for investors uh, to help with those projects. So contact us for more information. And in conclusion too, we wanna to hear from you uh, to take, we'd encourage you to take our survey uh, to give more input on our opportunity zones in Duluth. I think we have a real opp opportunity here that's you know, <laughs> obvious, but um, this is a city that can work together and get things done and make a difference. And um, I appreciate everybody taking the time to be a part of this and, and all the presenters and all of our partners. And, We'd be happy to answer questions if there's time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pam. Um, I'll just run through a couple of quick final slides here. But uh, so we just have a a few resources that we'll have in this slideshow, which of course we'll be sending everyone. We have the link to all of the submission forms to include projects in the MNOPCO directory. And we should add that everything in the MNOPCO directory gets then shared onto the LISC to LISC directory that Adam showed a moment ago. And I uh, also have a bunch of legal and accounting resources. Um, it made them Twin Cities based, including Danielle, who you heard from earlier today, but also several who are Duluth based to the people who we are aware of who have been working in opportunity zones from a legal and accounting standpoint. And uh, we strongly encourage that anyone who is seriously pursuing a deal, you know, get that legal and accounting advice that you need to move a project forward and make sure you're checking all the boxes. So these are it's not a comprehensive list, but there are people we're aware of who are working in this area. So I want to share that with everyone also. And finally, we just want to put up the contact information for all of our presenters today. So thanks to everyone for participating. And then we have a few minutes for some question and answer time. And I know we had a couple coming in the chat, one of which I think we you know partially answered, but I wanted to make sure that to just give people a chance to speak to it directly. So um, pull that up here. Um, so um, one was, uh, the question was, so what is your assessment of how successful or not um, uh, the, the projects in Duluth have been at meeting the original intention of Opportunity Zone legislation and um, just sort of reflecting on the experience to date. So if any of the presenters want to comment on that, particularly the Duluth-based ones, appreciate our re response there. Carl, I'm going to add to that and see if Adam wants to respond since it's most related to the projects he was saying. So 
Um, Adam, if you want to respond to that, but then also uh, add on to that the sustainable standards in the UDC for Duluth required for Opportunity Zone projects um, are, are there sustainably standards along with the PLA for OZ projects? Yeah, th thanks, Alyssa. Um, I'd say that, you know, the, the intent, as I understand it, of the enabling legislation was to create new opportunities for investment in the areas where uh, we had the Opportunity Zone designations established. And so by that metric, um, we are seeing it as a, as a positive thing. You know, I mentioned two residential projects and talked about our desire for, for a broader range of projects. Um, we've also got projects we're tracking in other neighborhoods like Lincoln Park uh, and didn't have time to really get into the details. Um, you know, I think there's some risk in, in the Opportunity Zone program, you know, considering that, that we do include like Canal Park. But broadly speaking, Canal Park's part of that census tract because we have a need for investment there. Um, of different kinds. And so if we're able to add housing, for example, in Canal Park, that's gonna serve a broader goal of the community and serve to benefit the residents of that census tract. And so I think it really is, um, from my perspective, been a positive thing um, for the city of Duluth. Awesome, Adam. One other question. Um, does the TIF financing increase the sustainability requirements of the project uh, in regard to building standards? And have investors had any comments or concerns for that? Um, thanks. Yeah, within the city of Duluth, uh, we don't have a TIF standard that relates to sustainability. The sustainability is adopted into our unified development code. Um, what we've seen is that developers in their uh, pursuit of meeting the, the state building code and the, the UDC uh, have really been constructing very energy efficient products. Um, but the specific requirements that we have in Duluth within our TIF program is the project labor agreement and then uh, more recently, and this didn't apply to, to everything, but um, a, we, we start with a 20% request for affordability with any given project as well. Awesome, thank you for that. I don't have any more here, Carl, unless you do. I do not, because uh, if anyone wants to verbalize a question, feel free to unmute yourself at this point and speak loud or just add it to the chat box. We have a couple minutes left here if you want to ask any questions for the panel. If anybody um, does, yeah, feel free to unmute. I just wanted to let our team from LISC and Cogent know that I've received a private message that people are not able to answer the survey. It says that they can't. So there might be something going on with the sharing or something. Yeah, we, we, we just, can make sure the right link goes out in the follow-up email. Yeah, we absolutely. Just, it's fixed now. Yeah, okay. someone said they were working on a fix, so. Okay. All right. Yeah, if you want to throw in the chat box one more time, that'd be great. Thank there you it is. for letting yep. us know. <laughs> well, all right. I think we're ready to wrap up. Just so everyone knows, we will send out the PowerPoints. We will um, set, we can send this link out for the, the form uh, for LISC and Cogent for people to respond. And then we are being recorded. And so this will be on the Monaco website. Great, excellent. Well done. Thank you all for being here today. And Thank you. Fun. Thanks so much to North Span. Thank you. Yep, <laughs> Thank thanks. You.